Cypress Crossing. Come on, set to your feet. Let's praise God together right here. Yeah, clap right. Yeah. Sometimes you gotta dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you gotta stand down the giant, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes you gotta shout from the mountain, loud in the valley, trusting that he's gonna get you there. Sometimes you gotta wait. Give me praise, give me praise in 
Jesus this morning. Come on, we sing. Oh, matchless in pursuit, your decision never swayed. The day you gave it all for me, and my entire death was paid. You didn't never hold me love, but you offer me your heart. So I'll follow your to be right away. Take a minute, turn around, and welcome somebody to Rivers Crossing today. As we started dreaming for Easter this year, we wanted to focus on the idea of Jesus coming from death to life. And we see this play out all around us in the spring. Winter is ending, all the darkness goes away, the sun comes out. 
and blossoming in front of us is these trees and these beautiful plants. And we thought, what a beautiful reminder of the grace that we receive from this moment of death and desperation and despair where all seemed lost, we see all life coming forth. And so as Jesus resurrects from death to life, so can we. And no matter where we were, dead in our sin, he found us and he brought us back to life. And so we wanna encourage everyone who sees Easter at Rivers Crossing this year, that they would know, that they would see this and they would know that spring is on the horizon. And even in the darkest moments, we can always find life. How many of us know that that's true, that even in the darkest moments, we can find life? My name's Sammy Moss. I have the honor of serving here on staff. And over the last several weeks, I've had the honor of seeing the planning and the preparation that's gone in behind the scenes for this year's Easter at Rivers Crossing, both creatively, from a worship standpoint, from a communication standpoint. And now we're in the most important part. We're, we've been praying bold prayers for you, for your family, for your friends, for your coworkers, for the invite cards you're gonna extend this week, for the texts you're gonna send, the conversations that you're gonna have, because we deeply believe by faith that there's someone, multiple someones sitting there today, currently dead in their sin, who are gonna find life for the first time this Easter at Rivers Crossing, and there's nothing that gets us more excited than that. So we can't wait to celebrate Easter with you and everyone that's coming with you. As a reminder, we have eight identical services happening from March 29th through the 31st. And we're asking you, if you call Rivers Crossing home, to join us on a Friday service, Saturday service, or Sunday at Deer Park, just to free up a seat for someone, again, to find life for the first time, to hear the gospel presented, perhaps for the first time in their life on a Sunday morning at one of our primary service hours. And as a reminder, these are identical services. So the worship message and all of our RC Kids programming, birth through sixth grade are the same at all campuses across all services. So there's not a bad time to be here to celebrate Jesus and the resurrection on Easter weekend. So we cannot wait to celebrate with you. As a reminder, those two questions that we're asking you to pray through this week as we look towards Easter is who's coming with you and when can you come on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday at Deer Park to free up a seat for someone to hear the gospel. If you need more information about those service times, check out the RC app or visit us on our website, riverscrossing.com. And if you are joining us today for the first time, I'm so glad that you're here and we would love the chance to meet you. So check out the VIP room before you leave today. There's a gift with your name on it that you get to go home with. And our team would just love to answer any questions that you've got about life here at Rivers Crossing. Today, we get to close out an incredible series called Mind Monsters, where we've learned both practically and biblically how to navigate taking control of the negative thoughts that sometimes rule our lives. So I'm so excited for where Pastor Josh is taking us today. Let's get started. Good morning, Rivers Crossing. How are you? Forty, hey, forty-five. You feel alive today. I could just, I could. Feel it, like the time change has passed. You're now, you're ready to go. You're, man, let's get it today. If I've never met you before, my name is uh, Josh. I have the honor of closing this message out today. I'm very excited. Uh, welcome to our church family down at Deer Park and our church family joining us online and here in Mason. I'm so glad that you could be here today. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Paul, he talked about stubbornness and he was kind of vulnerable on stage and, and he said, uh, that's a mind monster he struggles with. And he had some vulnerability there. And if you're not familiar with what my monsters are, we pulled this, if you're new here today, maybe it's your first time checking us out, we pulled this from an idea from Pastor Kevin Gerald. This is what he had to say about my monsters. My monsters are those negative thoughts we all battle, the creeping shadows in the corners of our minds that feed our insecurities, worries and fears, the thoughts that lead us to irrational anger and undefined depression. So Paul speaks on stubbornness. He says it's a my monster he struggles with. He's a little vulnerable. I like to be vulnerable. So I was like, I hope Paul gives me a mind monster that, that I kind of struggle with, but he didn't. He gave me a mind monster that I don't struggle with at all. A mind monster that we all struggle with. Say hello to this cute little fella, insecurity. <laughs> and if you're sitting there thinking the way I would be thinking if I was in your seat right now, I don't struggle with insecurity. I'm gonna do you a favor and me a favor and close this door 
because there's a pretty good chance you probably struggle with it more than anyone else in the room. It's great that insecurity is the one door that kind of sticks a little. Like it almost doesn't want to be shut, just trying to, get, we're going to leave him in there for now. I was putting my message together, just getting my notes kind of outlined a couple weeks ago, and I dropped my daughter off at gymnastics, and I went across the street to a diner, and was just kind of laying my outline. And while I was at the diner, I kid you not, the guys at the table next to me started to have a conversation that was very fitting for what we're talking about today. It was two guys, they were talking about a double date that they had just went on. Uh, so without their permission, I pulled my cell phone out. <laughs> and I recorded part of their conversation. And I'm gonna show it to you. So. Uh, <laughs> Check this out. So, uh, yeah, good time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all got along. Everyone seemed very pleasant. Yeah. What did Jody say? She had a good time. That it? Pretty much. Did she say anything about, uh... What? Nah, nah, it's all right. Great. She had a good time. Yeah. <laughs> he just hesitated. I was blowing on the coffee. She didn't like me. It's not like you're going to be spending a lot of time with her. So she doesn't like me? No. <laughs> she said that? Yes. She told you she doesn't like me? Yes. What were her exact I words? don't like him. Uh-huh. Why didn't she like me? Not everybody likes everybody. I tried to be nice. I wasn't nice. You were very nice. I've been over backwards for that woman. <laughs> You can pretend you're the person that doesn't want to be liked, but we all want to be liked. I would love to tell you that I don't struggle with insecurity, and people that are close to me will tell you that I will speak the truth even when it will cost me a relationship or a friendship. I value truth at that level, but it's not because I've found the magic secret to not wanting to be liked. I want to be liked. We all want to be liked. And at some point this morning, it's gonna, it's gonna feel like we're talking about this guy, fear. You guys remember this guy from week one? That cute little guy? We're not talking about fear. That's not what insecurity is. Fear is an outside threat. Someone or something that's coming to attack us. That's not insecurity. This is insecurity. Insecurity is uncertainty or anxiety about oneself, a lack of confidence. Insecurity is my own lack, my, my internal voice telling me that I'm not good enough, that I'm not capable enough. Fear is an outside threat. Insecurity is an internal voice. And there's this great moment in scripture that summarizes this really well. There's a great leader that God rises up, but he just struggles with insecurity. And I'll, I'm gonna say this a few times today because I don't wanna lose the people that this message will be the most impactful for. And it's the person that's still thinking right now, I don't struggle with insecurity. Listen, you can be tough, confident, you can be a winner, you can be a leader, you can be the boss, you can be admired, revered, you can be called by God, and you can still struggle with insecurity. So I don't wanna lose you this morning. There's this story about Gideon. So. The Israelites, they're in this pattern that they repeat over and over again where they're in trouble, they call on God for help, God comes and God saves them, he delivers them, he gives them some rules. Hey, live differently than everyone else around you, don't intermarry with other tribes, otherwise you'll wanna worship their gods, and set the example. And they never listen, they always intermarry, they end up worshiping other gods. Then God sends prophets and judges and says, either fix this or, or I'm, gonna, I'm going to leave, I'm gonna remove my hand from you. They never listen, he removes his hand from them, they cry out to God for help. He comes back, he saves them. It's this pattern. I'm thankful that that is like only a pattern in the Old Testament that we never do that. But there's this moment with Gideon where an angel of the Lord appears before Gideon. I'm gonna jump in to, to just after the start of their conversation. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the power of Midian. Am I not sending you? Here's Gideon's response. There's some blue here. Say it loud with me today. He said to him, please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look, my family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. This story, this part of their conversation is happening after an angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and says, hey, I know it's been seven years, but God's gonna use you to free Israel from the Midianites. And Gideon's like, that's his response. Well, how, me? He complains that God's not with me. God's abandoned us. And how, how many people hearing this message right now 
are in a situation where you've complained to God about your situation and then God has shown up and said, all right, I'm gonna get you out of this situation. I need you to do this, this, and this. And your response has been, well, how, me? I can't, do, I'll, just stay, I'll just stay in the situation that I'm in. See, the, the angel shows up and it tells Gideon, go in the power I've given you. But I'm, I'm so weak. Is it not I that's sending you? I'm, I'm so young. But I will be with you. You know what Gideon does next? A little test. He tells an angel, I think if, if you would do this, if, you, if an angel appeared to you, he tells this angel, set tight for a second. And Gideon goes and makes an entire meal. And then he brings it back and he sets it on a rock before the angel. And then the angel causes fire to come out of the rock and consume the food. You know what Gideon says then? Oh, now that I know you're from God, I have been filled with power and courage. Point me in the direction of the Midianites and I will take them on myself. Nope, not what he says. He goes, oh no, I've seen the face of God, now I'm gonna die. God keeps closing the door on insecurity for Gideon and Gideon keeps opening it back up. I've loved this translation that Paul has used during this series from, from Romans 12, talking about renewing, the renewing of our mind. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. God's not gonna show up on the scene, grab you by the shoulders, pin you down, and renew your mind against your will. There has to be a letting that takes place here. And insecurity shrinks when we let God speak to it. Insecurity shrinks when we let God speak to it. We have this saying around here that we are ordinary people seeking extraordinary lives. You know that jump from ordinary to extraordinary for most of us in the room, it's gonna involve us looking one of these mind monsters in the eye at some point, especially insecurity. And God can't deal with your insecurity until you let him. He can't deal with your insecurity until you're willing to let him deal with your stubbornness. He can't deal with your insecurity until you finally accept the grace of Jesus Christ to cover your guilt. He can't deal with your insecurity until you name your fear and then kill it. And from a practical place, this is gonna look different for a lot of us. Some of us, some of us need a therapist. You need a trusted person to walk through this with you. If you haven't checked out the podcast, we've been letting you know, we, we did a podcast, uh, four podcast episodes to go along with this series. They're short, they're 25 minutes, they're very good. Listen to them, send them to people in your life. Not, don't send the stubbornness one to everybody you know that's stubborn, because they won't listen to it. <laughs> listen to them, there, there's great nuggets in there from three mental health experts, and the one on insecurity we'll release later today. But we, we talked about this on that episode, that you need someone that's trusted to walk you through your insecurities. I, I spend less than an hour a week on social media, and it's mostly just for some work stuff here. I rarely get on there, and it never fails. Every time I get on there, I see someone has taken like the most intimate details of their life, and that's what they've chosen to put on social media. I, I don't understand that. I don't, I don't even know what your thought process is there, that you think, I'm struggling with this, so let's see if Bob that I haven't spoken to since the seventh grade, if he has any advice publicly that he could share with me. Find someone trusted to walk through this with you. Some of us need community. You need people in your life that have permission to speak into your life. So when I'm over here and I'm starting to open that door of stubbornness a little bit too much, I have men and a spouse in my life that will say, hey, let's, let's close this door and you not be such a bleep hole for the next little bit, right? If Paul can get on stage and say that we should on everybody, I can say bleep hole, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> If you don't get that joke, watch last week's message on Gil. I would say all of us need that daily worship and time in the word. I know for me, if, if life gets a little chaotic and I don't get that daily time with God, I, I lose some of my worship time or, or time in the word, or it's a little rushed, and I go a couple of days, I start to lose God's voice in my life a little bit. And I know this, the enemy is always speaking. Paul used this verse from Revelation last week. The accuser of our brothers, the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before God. He's always, always speaking, always whispering. And I, I, 
I think we, we get our perception of how Satan attacks us sometimes off. We feel like it's like it's straight on, like he's coming right at us and we can brace for this fight. I think Satan's favorite weapon is to just whisper to our insecurities. Because my insecurities sound like my voice. So if Satan whispers to my insecurities, I don't even know I'm in a fight. So I don't defend myself. And our insecurity shrinks when we close this door on if. My youngest is eight, Cyrus. He is in that what if stage of life. Any parents remember this absolutely horrible year or two of life? (laughs) And he's creative with a giant imagination. Everything I love about him takes this what if stage to level 10. So I could say, hey buddy, can you knock your homework out real quick? And he'll say, but what if I go to do my homework and the pencil lead breaks (laughs) and I have to sharpen it and what if I slice my finger open on the sharpener (laughs) and you can't get the bleeding to stop? What if we have to go to the hospital, but your truck won't start? What if you have to carry me to the hospital, but you can't get me there in time, and I bleed out and die? Church, I wish I was exaggerating or making that story up. (laughs) That played out two weeks ago in my house. (laughs) That word if, just just, is small, with a lot of power. And the word if unlocks the door on insecurity. See, greater is in me than he that is in the world. Amen? The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. Amen? You know who else knows that? Satan, the accuser, the enemy, Hasatan. So I don't think he comes at us straight on. I think he whispers. Think about what he does with Jesus. Jesus starts his public ministry. He gets baptized by John the Baptist. He goes out into the wilderness, and he's tempted by Satan. Look at how Satan comes to Jesus. This is the first time Satan approaches him. The tempter approached him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. The second time he comes to Jesus, and he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. If. If. That little word, just right here, just just rattling this door, just begging you to open it, if. I want to drive this point home, so I need a brave volunteer this morning. Wayman. (laughs) Can you jump up here on stage with me? Yeah. We don't have stairs, but I thought you could pull it off. You look nice today. That's the only reason I wanted you up here. You look sharp. (laughs) All right. Stand right here for me. If I come at you with aggression, and I wind up at some point, at some point, what do you do here? Something, right? (laughs) I need a smaller volunteer. I need a smaller. (laughs) At some point, you respond, you know you're in a fight, right? All right, come here. What if you face our beautiful church family? (laughs) Tomorrow, you're in your car driving, and what if the fight looks like this? You know, if that person really admired you, they probably wouldn't have said what they said, would they? If they, I mean, if they didn't mean that, they would have apologized, right? You know, if, if Pastor Wren knew what you were really going through right now, he would probably speak differently, right? I mean, if, you know, if you could go back in time five years, do that differently. If, if, if God really called you to that, wouldn't it have more success? If, if things don't change by tonight, you know what? I'm going to make some big changes. If the church really, if the church really cared about me, thanks, bro. You grab a seat. And you can play those statements out for yourself. You know what they are. You know what the enemy whispers to you. You know what your insecurities are. Just pulling at that word, if. The Bible's so rich, I I could spend three hours unpacking this. But Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days. The Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years. 
Jesus gets tempted by the same things that the Israelites were complaining about for those 40 years. They wanted food, they wanted protection, kingdom of their own, a place to call their own. And every time Satan shows up and whispers, if, what does Jesus say back? It is written. Why do you think he started by saying it is written? Because it had been written. The same rebuke that Moses gives the Israelites, that he's rebuking their heart, Jesus is quoting that rebuke to Satan. So when someone gets on stage and preaches, hey, maybe get into the word a little bit more often, and your, your stubborn door starts to open a little bit, nah, you just, you just teach me what I need to know. I know enough of the stories. Just know you're setting yourself up perfect for the enemy to whisper to you. Because when the enemy whispered to Jesus, he rebuked. When the enemy whispers to us, we rebuke. Or do we believe? So our, our, boy, our boy Gideon, he tears down some idols and he builds an altar to God, to Yahweh out of them. He upsets not only the Midianites, but two other tribes get upset that he did that as well. So all three of them join. It's 115,000 people. And it looks like they're going to attack Israel. And Gideon goes back to God with another test. Here's what it says. Then Gideon said to God, if you will deliver, deliver Israel by my hand, as you said, I will put a fleece of wool here on the threshing floor. If dew is only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, I will know that you will deliver, deliver Israel by my strength, as you said. Guess what happens? Just what he asked for. What do you think Gideon does? Here's what it says. This is what struggling with insecurity looks like. Then Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me. Let me speak one more time. Please allow me to make one more test with the fleece. Let it remain dry and the dew be all over the ground. See, let's make this personal. We're crowded. Who's had a hard time parking? Or don't raise your hand. <laughs> or has had to walk a little bit further than you want. Staff and first service volunteers, we're parking at a school and getting shuttled over at 6 a.m. So we're with you. We're crowded. People are getting stuck across the hall in our, our chapel venue. At some point, we'll need a fourth service. I hope we need a fifth service. I hope we, we'll do 20 services if we have to. But at some point, we'll need a fourth service, which means we'll ask many of you, hey, would you mind attending this fourth service? Then we'll ask a lot of you, would you be willing to serve at the fourth service? And we believe that if the harvest is ready, that the workers should show up, right? So we're praying a prayer as a staff that Jesus commanded us to pray. Bring the workers, because the harvest is ready. Well, if you look around, the harvest is here. And we're gonna ask for workers. And you're gonna, you're gonna hear that call, and you're gonna be like, ah, yeah, I think I'll do that. And then the Holy Spirit's gonna speak to your heart, and be like, all right, let, let's change services. Or hey, let's, we're free, we could, we could volunteer at this fourth service. And what do you think the enemy's gonna do in that moment? Well, sure, if you had the time, or if you had the talent, yeah, if you, if you were a better Christian. Or yeah, if the church would do that one ministry you've asked them to run, then you would do that one. Insecurity wants out of that closet bad. And I know this, I know the if game, when we sit there and we play that if game that we all play over and over and over again, it leads us to the comparison game. Satan whispers, if and we start to compare. And insecurity shrinks when we stop comparing. I won't spend much time on this because this gets unpacked really well on that podcast and I've already alluded to it, but as plainly as I can say it, some of you today, this afternoon, need to delete your social media. Not fast from it, not abstain from it, not be on it less, less just delete it. It'll be okay. You're gonna do just fine. You will go through life perfectly okay, not knowing what aunt so-and-so thinks about the current inflation issues. You'll be all right. You should go onto social media and you see this vacation and this, this great family photo right here, and you know the stuff you see on social media. And you start to compare, and you instantly feel less than. Why would you allow something? It's screaming at your insecurities, and you can't get enough of it. Why? Deleting that doesn't make you weak, it makes you smart. You realize something is killing you, 
So you're cutting it out of your life. I'll be a little bit vulnerable with you. So every time I preach, I come backstage here. Jay over here can attest to this this morning. I come back and I, and I worship a little bit because I start to get fearful. And I, I could get on stage, make a couple jokes. You would laugh at half of them. See, that's an example where half of you laughed at them. <laughs> I could say something profound. I could leave the stage. That, that's not heavy. But something about the gospel, preaching the gospel, gets really heavy for me. And my watch will tell me I have a high heart rate backstage. My hands get a little sweaty. My mouth gets dry. I'm trying to get my notes together for the start, and they're a little bit jumbled. It's this holy fear that what I'm about to do requires something that I can't do on my own. And it's great for my pride, because it reminds me every single time, I can't do this without the Holy Spirit. It's not me. And I'm so thankful that every time I walk out on stage, the Holy Spirit does show up with the help of water and begins to settle me down a little bit. But if I, if I don't deal with that backstage, where does my mind all of a sudden start to go? I'll give you an example. This wasn't this morning. This was a while ago. Backstage, I'm worshiping through that, and I just kind of am pacing. I look down, and I look down at my shoes. And if you didn't know, I like Converse quite a bit. And someone said to me a long time ago, just in the lobby, like, hey, you've got a, you've got a lot of nice shoes. And they meant it as a compliment. But all of a sudden, I'm backstage, and all of a, I'm thinking, like, do people think I have too many nice shoes? <laughs> do people think I have thousands of dollars in Converse at home in my closet? Should I come out on stage and tell people that these shoes are three years old? I just take care of them because I like them? I need, I need to let people know that I wear my boots from the truck to the and just put these on in my office so they stay really nice. And they've never been outside. <laughs> should, I, should I tell them, like, they, these shoes are only 45 bucks and my kids bought them for me for Christmas? It, oh my goodness, I'm going to walk on stage and some family is going to see my shoes and go, we've had enough, and they're going to stand up and leave the church. <laughs> some family this morning is going to quit tithing because I have worn Converse on stage today. And if I'm not careful, uh -oh. <laughs> I'll see the, the comparison game lets insecurity out of the closet. And you know where you can find insecurity? Oh, he likes to play with his best friend. Yeah, oh boy, you're in trouble when this happens. And I was kind of getting my, my thoughts together, and again, we've got these mental health experts, so I'm, I'm reaching out to them for advice. So I was like, man, there's, there's got to be a relationship between insecurity and fear. So I emailed them. So I emailed the three therapists that we had that were on part of the podcast. Here's the simple email that I sent over to them. Very short. So does fear cause insecurity, or does insecurity cause fear? Now, Brett was the first person to respond. Excuse me. Dr. Brett Dowdy was the first person to respond. And great wisdom, but he's a doctor. So... So his language back is a little heavy. It's a little deep. Uh, and I think in order for us to unpack it, we need to see it together and read it together. So would you read his response back to me together? Yes. <laughs> I'm kidding. Brett goes on to say that you can have insecurity without fear, and you can have fear without insecurity. But when you let them play together, they exacerbate each other. They feed off of each other. Yeah, I'll, I'll play this out for you. So I'm backstage. I'm now stuck looking at my stupid shoes. And if I don't get out of that mindset, did I wear the right thing on stage today turns into, why am I on stage? Should I, should I even be the one on stage today? And then it turns into fear. What if I didn't prepare enough? What if my... Thoughts get all jumbled up in my head. Well, what if I'm just hitting a place where I'm not very good at this? What if Pastor Paul starts to think I'm not very good at this? And before I know it, did I wear the right shoes turns into I'm a total fraud. And that can be funny for you, but don't act like you've never in your life gone down the rabbit hole of chaos when nothing bad has happened. Nothing wrong has happened, and you're still convinced the whole sky is falling around you because of insecurity and fear. And that brings me into my next point. Insecurity shrinks when we find our identity in Christ alone. See, 
I cannot tie my ability to preach the gospel to my identity. Jesus loves me and values me. Now, I want to come out and preach good. I want to preach great. I want to honor the giftings that God has given me. I want to honor our lead pastor, Pastor Paul, who's gracious enough to let me step into his pulpit as a guest. I want to honor you, my church family. I want to challenge you with something that I'm being challenged with. But I can't tie my abilities to my identity. Otherwise, what happens if I lose this ability? Or what happens if I just miss the mark? If your identity is always tied to being able to close the next sale, what happens when the next one doesn't close? If your identity is being the best mom in the history of the world, what happens when the kids grow up and move out? There's this great scene in in The Chosen, uh, and I've become obsessed with The Chosen. We're watching it with the family. It's great for our our kids. We've been watching it quite a bit. And Jesus is talking to Simon the Zealot one-on-one. If you don't know what a zealot is, they were a religious cult. And they were assassinating different leaders, and their ultimate goal was to cause the uprising of the Jews, and they would overthrow the Romans. That's what their ultimate goal was. Uh, Barabbas, who Pilate freed in place of Jesus, would have been a zealot, a religious zealot. And Simon is in in The Chosen. He's got this little dagger. He's very proud of it. He wakes up every morning, and he trains with his dagger. If you've seen it, he's doing all these flips that I can't do on stage. But he's training with this dagger. He's very proud of it. It's It's who he is. And his assumption is, when Jesus tells him to follow him, that this is why Jesus wants me to follow him because of my gift with this dagger. And they're talking together, and Jesus says, can I see your dagger? And Simon's thrilled, absolutely. He pulls it out, hands it to Jesus. Jesus goes, it's a really nice dagger. Simon's beaming. And then Jesus just casually throws it into the water. Simon has to wrestle in that moment, wrestle in that moment. is following Jesus enough? This may shatter your belief system. Jesus doesn't need you. He wants you. He wants you. You don't have to go home today with your giftings and go, God, are you proud of how I use my giftings today? He's going to shove that aside. I'm just proud of you. I just want you. I told you this is the kind of thing that to be, you've got to be vulnerable with this. And I'll start, because the way to defeat vulner- the way to defeat insecurity is to just keep being vulnerable with your flaws. So I'll go first, and you can go later at home, not in front of a few thousand people today, and share yours. But a few months ago, we did a series, a family series called Stuck Together, and I preached on parenting. And I talked about my father and how his final words to me were parent softer. And I cried a bunch on stage. Pastor Brandon's never let me live that down. But I challenged you as a church to do that, to parent softer. Maybe let's pull back on the discipline a little bit. Let's engage with our kids better. How do you think I felt on Tuesday of that week, two days later, when I yelled at my two oldest kids? Yeah, screamed at my two oldest kids. I told them not to do something. Almost immediately, they went and did it, and I came unglued. What do you think the enemy couldn't wait to do? If you were a better dad, if, if you were a better pastor, you're a, you're a total fraud. And see, if you don't like that idea of being vulnerable, and, and I'll just, it's, it's okay. When you come home tomorrow from work and your spouse says, how was your day? It's okay to say, it was good until I screwed up and I made a mistake. Can I tell you that your spouse will still love you? that they're not just loving you because you're good at work. You can pull your abilities and your identity at home away from each other. It's okay. Because when you reject that vulnerability, do you know what insecurity ultimately leads us to? Narcissism. Because if I have to hide my flaws, then I have to give off this image of being perfect. At some point, I start to believe that I'm perfect, which means I'm always right. So that that person you know who's never wrong, can never say they're sorry, or if you're the person who can never say you're sorry, guys, I would be in the audience right now broken if someone else was giving me this message. I've had the privilege of the Holy Spirit giving me this in private a couple weeks ago. If you're the person who struggles to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, yeah, you probably have some stubbornness, 
you're probably really struggling with insecurity. The person who's crippled by this, who just, you can never enjoy someone else's success without bringing your own up. Oh, you like that? I love that. Oh, you went there on vacation? Oh, I, I went here on vacation. Vulnerability is the key to shrinking that. There's this really cool moment in scripture that I, that I love, and like a lot of things that Jesus did, it's, it's doing a lot of things other than just one thing, but Jesus asks his disciples a key question. In Mark it says, but you, he asked them again, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you were the Messiah. Do you know why I think Jesus asked his disciples again, who do you say that I am? Because you can't know who you are until you know who he is. You can't know who you are until you know who he is. How can you have an identity that's not found in him without one that's struggling with his door open? This morning, we're going to close by singing a song together. It's, it's a song that our worship team wrote last year called You Are. I know we always have to set this up whenever we do a close like this. It's like, please don't leave. Even if, even if you're serving, you can, you can stay here and, and, <laughs> and allow yourself to be in the moment. And if you get up and leave early today, we're just going to think you really struggle with insecurity more than everybody else. So, <laughs> I want you to lean into this song. I don't care if worship's not your thing. I want you to lean into this song. It talks about God's identity and then our identity. Declaring who he is and then declaring who we are. And I, I always share my message with my wife pretty much before I share it with anyone else. And they are, better, they are better for it. So if you ever see my wife, know that you would get some really random stuff up here if, if I was ever preaching without her reading through it first. And she's like, you can't end there. You've gotta set that up. And she's a therapist, she sees people all day long and she's like, I, I see so many people that struggle with insecurity even though that's never the reason that they came into my office. And if the person has a faith component, she will ask them at some point, who does God say that you are? And no one can answer it. Or if they can't answer it, it's like, I'm a child of God. Just the check. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever stopped to unpack that? Have you ever gotten someplace quiet and allowed Jesus to unpack that? Well, you're a child of God. That's my challenge to you during this song. Just five more minutes. We'll dim the lights, raise your hands in worship. Let the tears come for some of us in the room that have spent 20 years trying to please everyone else by our abilities trying to make that parent proud still, trying to define ourselves by our abilities, chasing and chasing and chasing, telling our closest friends just how good we are because we're so scared we'll lose the friendship if they don't know we're awesome. Set all that down and allow Jesus to actually speak to your identity that you're a son. Let him take your dagger that you're so proud of and toss it in the water. Let him be enough. Because when you understand who he is, then you can finally understand who you are. And when you truly understand who you are in Jesus, that's when you can finally close this door and keep it shut. Spoken darkness about tonight 
As all creation formed, you were the word he chose to send to bring it all to light. Heaven sent to walk among the world you loved. The word of God to be the son of man. You met me in the dirt with my accusers all around and took me by the hand. I've heard the stories of all that you claim to be. And there's one simple truth that can change everything. Jesus, you. Pastor Josh for that word. If the last point Josh made is gonna stick with you all week, like it has for me since I heard it on Thursday when he ran it through with our team, that we cannot know who we are until we know who Jesus is. We have an incredible resource available to you on our website. It's this giant document called Our Identity in Christ According to Scriptures, and it's all the things that the scripture tells us that we are because of who Jesus is and what he did for us. So that's available to you on our website as you process through this message throughout the rest of the week. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team has been praying for you. They'd be honored to pray with you after the service right down front alongside of the stage. If you came prepared to give today, there's four ways to do that on the screen behind me. I wanna say thank you to all of you who give generously to Rivers Crossing and through Rivers Crossing, all the things that we're able to do like incredible Easter services next weekend. So thank you again for your generosity. Have a great week. We'll see you starting Friday for Easter at Rivers Crossing. <laughs>